This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. My guest is Paul Morantz. He's a Southern California lawyer who has had a one-of-a-kind career litigating and fighting against such organizations as the Unification Church, Scientology, and EST. But more than 30 years ago, that career almost came to a very abrupt end. That's when another cult-like organization called Synanon tried to have him killed by planting a live rattlesnake in his mailbox. Morantz describes this incident and many others in his new book called Escape, My Lifelong War Against Cults. Paul Morantz, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thank you. So, uh, three or four days ago, I was talking to a, a friend of my wife's, and I was telling her that I was going to be interviewing Paul Morantz, and she didn't know who Paul Morantz was, but then I s mentioned the rattlesnake and Synanon, and her eyes lit up, and she knew who that guy was. So it occurred to me then that for more than 30 years, you've been that guy who was uh, the target of this bizarre attack that everyone remembers. So I guess I'm wondering, um, just how much did your life change after you met up with that rattlesnake? Well, I changed in so many ways. I doubt I could list them all, but one was um, my goal was never to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a writer, and that was my first love. And I had sold the TV movie of the week, and I had uh, written many magazine pieces. I had the Zanuck brothers wanting to hire me to work on scripts. Um, I had become successful as a writer and thought that I was going to get off the law train, so to speak. And, uh, and then when Synanon happened, it uh, so, I don't know how to say this, it's so, um, somebody had to do something about them. And I knew that something very wrong was going on. I didn't know quite yet what it was, but I sort of had the feeling that this was why I was placed on Earth, that this was my, my moment, and, um, and that I had to rise to the occasion. And so with it, my writing career ended, because the success of the litigation against Sinanon brought cold case after cold case after cold case. My fiance at the time, I was going to get married, had two kids, and uh, uh, she became too afraid and left, and I took that very hard. And um, so the life that I thought I was gonna have with her was gone. Yeah. And um, lastly, I'm ill today, and much of my illness traces back to the rouse. Yeah, so let's uh, take this one piece at a time. A after the attack, did your life change dramatically? Well, my life changed dramatically in that uh, I got, what's his name, he calls his 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, Andy yeah. Warhol, I think it was 15. Yeah, Andy Warhol, <laughs> that, that certainly happened, and it was odd to walk down the street and people mobbing after you for your, uh, for your well, autograph. It was more than 15 minutes, I mean, people still remember that. Well, I would say it was more like five to 10 years. <laughs> you know, but eventually it was, your name sounds familiar. Where do I know that, Did, that name from? Were there any particularly strange reactions you got from people when you told them you were that guy that got attacked by the rattlesnake? Well, the, the one that's in my book about the, um, the, uh, the old man at the liquor store, um, it was in 19, early 1990s, and um, we were at a party, and um, 
they ran out of alcohol and I volunteered to go get some beer and wine and I went to a little corner market on Main Street. And when the guy came back with my credit card, he said, take the beverages, but we won't take your money. Hmm. And you can come back here anytime you want and take all you want, but we'll never take your money. And I thought he was crazy. And then I turned and looked out the window and facing me in the sky was the old tall Synanon building. Hmm. And then I looked back at him and he said, they used to march down the street like Nazis. You got rid of them. You come back here anytime you want. You take whatever you want, but we'll never take your money. Wow. So three weeks before you met up with that snake, you had won a three hundred thousand uh, dollar judgment against Synanon, right? And uh, you were representing a married couple uh, uh, who claimed that the wife had been held captive by the organization. Uh, did you feel at that point that your life was in danger after you won that award? Oh, uh, way before. Um, Synanon had trained the Imperial Marines which was a hit force, trained them in depot flats, and their chain of command was through the Synanon Legal Department to certain other individuals, to Dan Garrett. The head of the Imperial Marines was a doctor named Doug Robeson, and they had attacked, and we knew and could verify, uh, over four years, 80 different people that they had physically attacked. There had not yet been a murder attempt, possibly one where they whipped a rancher with the butts of their shotguns while holding their wife and, and his children prisoner with guns. He could have died. Um, but in September, on September 19th, Phil Ritter, who was a former Synon member who was trying to get his child out and warn people about the forced bisectomies, came home and two Imperial Marines came out of the bushes and began to try to kill him with ax handles that cracked his skull. And only the shouts of people who came by saved his life. Now, once I knew of that, I knew they wanted me more than I wanted Phil Ritter. And I was receiving information from people who talked inside sitting on the members that I was next and that uh, Charles Diedrich had given the order and that they had my home address. So what sorts of precautions did you take? Well, one is I walked into a, a gun store, which I never had done before in the valley, saw all these rednecks going <laughs> around like this, and uh, when I finally said, and I was in a suit, and I finally said, can you help me? I said, yes, I'd like something that would get maybe five people all at once if they came through the door. And um, so I purchased a shotgun. I, uh, I had sort of rescued the L.A. Police Department from Warner Earhart and Est, and the uh, intelligent officers, believe me, and they were trying to get protection. And they notified West LAPD, and the very day that I got bit, I had come from a meeting with Threat Analysis Department of the California Department of Justice. You mentioned Charles uh, Dietrich, the guy who founded Synanon, yeah. led it. Uh, describe him for me. Uh, Orson Welles. Orson Welles. <laughs> yeah, Orson Welles. Uh, a very sinister Orson Welles. Yeah, Orson Welles playing in his most sinister movie. Um, although the guy who played him in the Synanon movie did, <laughs> did a pretty good job, too. He was basically a roundish man. Uh, who wore shorts and flops and a Hawaiian shirt. He had a tick in his eye like this that went from uh, about with spedomonogitis in the 30s uh, and then saved his life was the discovered penicillin. And uh, his lip was partly paralyzed. And he was a person who, when he spoke, his words were very repetitive and very charismatic to his followers. Mm. And um, he you know, ultimately say, I made you all sane, I can make you insane. And people were afraid of his punishments. Mm. He could throw you out of Synanon. And basically everyone either hopped on board or left. He had what he called the squeeze. 
squeezing uh, the rotten fruit off trees, which meant that he could make a notion, something you had to do, just to get rid of the people who wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. such as you have to all have isectomies. You have to all give up your wife and partner and take a stranger that we picked for you. you know? So did he seem like an ominous character to you or a charismatic character or a little bit of both? I never really saw the char char charisma myself. You just saw the ominousness. Yes. The evil. Yes, <laughs> but I think I had events in my life that made me more awakened uh -huh. to that. So let me take you back to that uh, October day in 1978 uh, when you stuck your hand in that mailbox and felt these fangs digging into your hand. How vividly do you remember that day? I remember moment? it vividly moment by moment. Yeah. The only thing I can say to you is that uh, the human mind is not a computer. It doesn't register every fact and compute, and no voice went off saying, danger, Will Rogers, danger, Will Rogers. I had come from a meeting with the AG's office asking for protection in my life. I was very tired. The Dodgers and the Yankees' first game of the World Series was starting on TV. I wanted to forget Sinan for one moment and watch it. And I saw out of the corner of my eye as I entered my house that something oblong was in my mailbox. I wasn't wearing glasses because I didn't own any because I was too vain. And I often didn't put in my heart contacts because they were too painful. And I sort of knew the name of the streets between my home and my office. I thought maybe it was an oblong package or a scarf that some kid found and stuffed in my mailbox. Now this was a time in which before I start my car, I would search underneath it. I would look both ways, crossing the streets. I wouldn't enter my house if my dogs weren't barking. Um, and yet with all these precautions, I just didn't think. I just nonchalantly turned open and stuck my hand in. And um, when the head came out and bit my hand, um, I remember thinking, no, this one was too stupid. They can't have pulled this off. Mm. You know, and like gin rummy, it was like when you make a discard and you think, oh, wait a second, I want to pull that card back and discard another. And I was like, I wanted to reel it back and smartly look inside before I, mm. before I opened it, but it was too late. Let me read from your book uh, your description of that moment when the snake you know, grabs you. you, you write, quote, it, it lashed out too quickly for me to react. I could see its mouth open, its fangs sink, sink deeply into my wrist. I screamed, let go, and watched in horror as more than four feet of snake dropped to the floor and recoiled, posed to strike again. I saw the V-shaped head and knew it was a rattlesnake. I quickly glanced at my wrists, leery of taking my eyes off my foe, but somehow hoping beyond hope that what I had felt wasn't real. I saw the marks. Those bastards, I thought, they had really done it. So you, you never heard a rattle, did you? No. Later in the hospital, and they said to me, are you sure it was a rattlesnake? And I thought of the V-shaped head, and I said, yes. And then I said, but you know, I didn't hear rattles. And of course, later I found out that they had cut the rattles off the snake. So after the, rat after the snake bit you, what, what happened next? Uh, I tried to remain calm. I knew that firemen would have to come and I had to secure the house so no kids came in the house. My dogs was my pattern at the time. They, uh, Tommy and Devin, when I came home, they greeted me and then ran out and played in the front yard. When I screened, they were now heading full charge back to the house, and I had to lean over the snake and shut the front door on my dog. And, um, who found you? So, uh, well, I went to the back of the house and kicked out a wood block that held the sliding glass door shut. And then I went out the side door uh, of my house and locked it. I locked the front door. And I started screaming to my neighbor, Edie Dittmars, 
uh, ED, I've been bitten by a rattlesnake. It was sitting on a uh, call for an ambulance and get me ice. And, um, and I was on the street. Apparently, I was told that, um, that I went over to Edie's front door demanding ice and that I actually unhinged her door, pushing so hard against it. And then all the neighbors came out and uh, pulled me on the ground. And everyone came over with buckets of ice. And as luck would have it, um, there was a professor, Irv Markowitz, who was home early to go for a religious holiday. And uh, he had just finished a, uh, a course on what to do with rattlesnake bites. <laughs> and so he tore off his shirt, tied a tourniquet around my, uh, around my arm, and tried to cut and suck out the blood. So, yeah, I've never been bitten by a rattlesnake. So on a 1 to 10 scale, how, how uh, painful is it? It's extremely painful. It's, um, it's not like the movies where John Wayne goes, spits and jumps back on the horse and goes after the bad guys. It's like having your hand in a vice. See, part of the poison kills, but another point destroys tissue and softens it so that it can swallow the, the animal. And um, that is very painful because it's destroying the tissue inside your hand. I once made it comparable to having your hand in a vice and someone's cranking it up. And then there's a pause, and then they start re-cranking again. Later years, there's a story about someone who got bit on the hand by a rattlesnake, and he used the same analogy. Mm -hmm. Did you come close to dying, Paul? Well, they, that's what the doctors told the media, and that's what I was seeing on TV. But they would tell me inside, you're doing better than that. Don't pay any attention to what we say on TV. You point out in your book that uh, Synanon didn't start out as a violent cult. It started out as a relatively benign drug rehab program. What was the turning point? Was there, can you identify a turning point? Yeah, very easily, yes. First, um, Diedrich was an AA fanatic who then volunteered for an LSD uh, trip, which made him think that he saw insights into mankind. And he began to read at the library Eastern philosophies and various books. And the AA speeches, which had religious overtones, Diedrich was now being philosophical and psychological and developed his own following who would come to his apartment and they developed what would be later called the game, where they would sit in a circle and attack each other's behavior, supposedly with the rude truth, but truth wasn't required. You could say anything to cause an effect. And uh, Sinan got discovered by Life magazine, which did a 14-page spread. Santa Monica arrested him for operating without a license without his own, and he went to jail for 60 days, which made him a martyr, and more and more money now began to, to pour in. And the fact is, he wouldn't keep statistics. And what he really had was, is he had a lot of old-timer addicts who had had enough. And if they could get themselves into a home and fed with fellows like themselves and bond as a group, um, they were capable of staying away from drugs. The fact is, is that the ultimate statistics done by 64 showed that Sinan had no greater success than Kensington Hospital. And Diedrich, by 66, realized that most of the people who left Sinan went, went back to drugs. So in 67, he decided that the only cure was that no one ever leaves. He also had ambitions of building cities and changing the world. And so in 67, he ended the idea that anyone would ever leave. And he also instituted a concept called containment, which is we don't go off the property. We don't associate with other people. And he began to build cities in, in Marin County, later in Visalia, later in Lake Havasu. 
and that uh, they would be complete cities with their own movie theaters, swimming pools, riding stables, motorcycles, and so it was a cradle to grave society. Now when you do that, it cut off for Diedrich any opportunity for him to ever come across anybody who would say no to him. In other words, he's, he's being followed by people saying, yes, Mr. Diedrich, yes, Mr. Diedrich, no matter how crazy. So he acquired an absolute say. power over these people. Which and that, corrupts, and absolutely. That power, and that power corrupted him. Yes. So after you got out of the hospital, Paul, you actually deposed Dietrich. And uh, it's not every day that a lawyer gets to depose the guy who tried to kill him. Uh, what was that like? It was pretty harrowing. Um, I would actually had a nightmare the night before that I was, he wouldn't answer any questions. And the more I asked questions, his entourage was surrounding me and getting closer and closer. And then I woke up by the alarm, you know, ringing in the room, the telephone rang, and, and, uh, and had to go do it. The court reporter, who had no idea what was going on later, told me that the tension in the room was so strong she got a stiff neck. But I already had enough evidence for the two cases I was there. You were representing people who claimed to have been harmed by the group. Yes, one was a rancher that they, in Visalia that we uh, pistol whipped, and by the way, for since this is a legal show, it might be of interest. He was attacked in 1977, and I think this was 1981. We didn't have a one-year statute of limitations. And he was kind of three years too late. But my argument to the, to the judge was that um, because of the attack on me, that every lawyer in Visalia was chicken, and no one would take his case, and it's not his fault that he couldn't file a lawsuit, and Sinan should be a stop to assert the statute of limitations because they created a reign of terror. And then I said something, well, there's a new sheriff in town, and I'm here to bring justice to the Edson family. And mm -hmm. the judge kind of looked back, and I think he smiled, and I think he just wanted someone there to take him on, and so he uh, denied their motion under the statute of limitations. Yeah. And we continued on. I have to say, though, having read your book, it does seem to me that your uh, feelings toward Diedrich are, are rather complicated. Yeah. Uh, you write that, quote, there was a strange, creepy bond between, the, between us. Yeah. Uh, you also say that you began to see the world through the prism of Dietrich's madness, which you add didn't make you a particularly convivial cocktail guest. Yes. Well, what do you mean by that? Uh, several things. One is, probably even before the rattlesnake, I listened to so many Chuck Diedrich's tapes and his way of thinking that they were in my head. And um, he had a very down view of the world and people, and I sort of started to adopt it. In the ABC settlement, if you read my book, certainly had, um, had added to that. Secondly, do you know what the Stockholm Syndrome is? Sure. It was like we were both captive to each other. Um, I realized a point when I had to tell my fiance about all the violence. I mean, try to imagine you're being at dinner and she says, what's new, dear? And I said, well, Sinan purchased $307,000 worth of weapons plus armor-piercing bullets. How was your day, you know? And uh, uh, I was captured. I was past the point of no return. And Diedrich was captured by me. Mm. I was out there to destroy him. And so we both had a sort of morbid curiosity about the other. So this may sound like a dumb question, but after you got out of the hospital, did you ever consider another line of work, like, you know, like trying to find tax loopholes for rich guys? I mean, something a little calmer and maybe more lucrative? Let me explain it this way, if I can. In 1974, I had just published the lead story for Rolling Stone magazine that in 76 would be bought by CBS and made into a movie in 78, and my dreams had somewhat, you might say, came true. But through a series of unique events, I discovered that Skid Row alcoholics were being kidnapped 
and sold to nursing homes for $125 a head, shot with Thorazine in prisons, and then Medi-Cal would be billed. I was intrigued by the idea that these people never thought that these Skid Row alcoholics could group together, rise up, and sue them in court. And that became very uh, much an obsession with me. And it was the success of, success of that case that led to my first Synanon case coming to me. Do you see a direct connection between oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, this? Oh, yeah. If the a nursing, a nursing home case hadn't happened, I would never got the Synanon case. In between them, I met Trudy and her two kids and fell in love and thought that was going to be my life and that I would go back to writing. Yet at the same time, when the man called me to say Sinanon had his wife, my first reaction was, there's an explanation. Um, all I have to do is call the health department and ask for a licensing official to go in and find out what the story was. And when I called licensing, they said, Sinanon's not licensed, and they don't let us in. And he said it in a hushed voice, like he was afraid someone was going to overhear him. And at that point, when I hung up the phone, I knew something was truly wrong. And the feeling that I had was joy, because I couldn't stand the practice of law. Hmm. I couldn't stand tax cases, divorce cases, personal injury cases. I could have never stayed in being a lawyer. The only thing that, that I found was was going after bad guys. So you were hooked on the excitement. Yes. You were hooked on the danger of it. Yes. Uh, but it did take a toll on your personal life, didn't it? Very large. But you know how things that are funny, I would have married Trudy and this raised is your her first kids. wife, right? No, this is my my fiance when I was fighting son. Yeah. And she left me because of fear for her children. If I had married her, I would have not married my first wife. I would not have had my own child. He would have not gone to work at JPL and helped build the robot Curiosity and help with design the landing and for all we know Curiosity, but for a rattlesnake might have crash landed on Mars. Mm. <laughs> so things have a funny way in life of, uh, of working out sometimes. Yeah. You know, as you described your experiences, uh, I got the sense that you were kind of like a character in, in the X-Files series. Remember that program? I, I Only... used to feel it was more like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Yeah, you know, I mean, the guy's walking along, he's doing something innocent, all of a sudden he overhears a conversation, no one believes him, and the next thing he has to do is save the world and save the girl. And, you know, we've all seen that plot and story so many times. But to live it is quite something else. I have post-stress syndrome. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You described one uh, incident where you were working on a case uh, involving Scientology, I believe, and you went into a library to do some research on Scientology, and you discover that all of the articles and all of the magazines you looked at that had anything to do with Scientology were ripped out. I mean, that, that sort of experience would kind of make anyone a little paranoid. Is paranoia, <laughs> and a, a, what was, did that become kind of an occupational hazard for you? Well, yes, no. First of all, I didn't have a case against Scientology at the time. I just thought it was only a matter of time, so I was researching it. Um, and um, uh, it raised a lot of questions for me as to how fanatical people could be or or how large of a job did they actually go to every library in the United States. Um, I think I wasn't mature enough to quite realize how much in danger I was. Mm -hmm. And after the rattlesnake, I felt I had a shield of protection. I felt that no cult was going to do anything because of the media blitz that would follow. I mean, if I felt that if uh, somebody in Scientology said, I'm going to go to, down to Palisades and shoot Morantz, that he wouldn't make it out the door. Mm -hmm. you know, so I believed that I had a shield of protection from that point on. 
I, it was naive. It was a na naive view as I was to learn about other lawyers who were murdered by cults. And, um, um, but that's the one I had. Did, were there any other attempts on your life? Uh, I had some instances with Scientology where they blocked my car coming out. I've had uh, a lot of threats, and um, but I can't say that um, you know whether or not anyone ever had me within their mm. scope. And luckily, I ducked them to the coffee shop or something. I, I don't know. I do know this: that before the rattlesnake, that Sinan Price, the hitman, ten thousand dollars. And that at the last moment, Diedrich uh, decided that, well, why should we pay any money? This is what we trained the Imperial Marines for. You know, we should do it ourselves. And that decision saved my life. Mm. And in fact, you dedicate the book to Diedrich. Yes, for making that decision. For making that decision. Yes. So this is the only kind of work you did as a lawyer. Is that no, right? no, no, no. Uh -huh. It was what I was centered around. But in 1981, I took on a cult case against a cult run by doctors, the Center for Feeling Therapy, where they beat their patients and had sex with their patients. And then I became an advocate. There was about four lawyers who, who felt the same way to push the concept that any sex between a therapist and a patient was all, always harmful. And eventually, that became a statute. And uh, so I had a subspecialty in that area. I used to get two or three sex with therapist cases. Mm -hmm. I had some personal injury cases because, you know, they're easy and you have friends. Um, but uh, sometimes you write a contract and something here. But to put it into perspective, I would have my cult case. And in addition to that, I might have eight other files. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. At any one time, was it was yours a lucrative practice? It turned out to be, but it wasn't the motive. And if I ever lost any one of these cases, I used to say I would have been back with my old Skid Row clients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what other cults did you go up against? You went up against Synanon. Uh, you tangled with Est a little bit, yeah. Scientology, Jim Jones, Jim Jones, Center for Feeling Therapy. Um, um, the Moonies, Jean Gattuso, twice, who you wouldn't be quite familiar with, uh, Hare Krishna, uh, some names that you wouldn't be familiar with. But you know, a lot of my cases were not money, they were rescue. It was to rescue children. The word cult has a very pejorative ring to it. Uh, what exactly makes a cult a cult? Well, I think the question is sort of irrelevant. It's um, the cult has become a journalism term, but the actual definition of a cult, a group of people that uh, follow a similar way of belief or leader, is in essence a uh, harmless situation. Mm -hmm. The ones that uh, morph into something that is malignant we refer to as destructive cults, or as Lifton referred to them, that's uh, Dr. Robert J. Lifton, totalistic communities, which means a community in which there is only one way of thinking. You're talking about communist Russia, communist China, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein. Mm. Cults are like a microism of uh, nations. Nazis is, was probably maybe the best example. It was a small cult when it began. Is there a fuzzy line between being anti-cult and being anti-religion? No, they have nothing to do with each other. First of all, not all cults are religious, and um, some of the strongest anti-cult people are very religious. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically it's anti-abuse. Mm -hmm. It's anti. It takes an example. In a bona fide religion, the number one thing is how do we help our flock? And in a destructive cult, the number one situation is how can the flock serve the leader? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As tied up with the idea of a cult is this notion of brainwashing. Yeah. Now, do all cults share in common an interest in brainwashing? 
Well, first of all, brainwashing can happen naturally. It's sort of part of human nature. But how much uh, totalism might exist in various groups could be a matter of degree. But I call it the art of convincing someone to take on a new set of beliefs and at the same time believe that you've taken on those beliefs voluntarily. But what's the distinction between brain, being brainwashed and simply being conned? Well, you con, you con, and, you, and pretty quickly you know you're conned. Uh, here, the situation is that you've been conned into a new set of beliefs and you join, and until you wake up and realize you're conned, mm. you're going to. So be it's a question of degree? Remember. It's a large, well, a large degree. Yeah. First of all, what brainwashing really is, is that you, um, is you, is, have a person immersed into a population of true believers and you have him play with these people, sing songs with these people, attend lectures with these people and less powerful or less evolved as a charismatic leader as it is all the people telling the person I used to be just like you but now I've seen the light and I'm so happy and, and I'm so wonderful. And then the person starts to think, well, could I, could I become like him? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's basically sort of a, a group uh, persuasion. What about Tom Cruise, a very uh, uh, outspoken advocate of Scientology? Is he brainwashed? Yeah, I would say that, that Tom is brainwashed, but it's not the whole story. Uh, is it ever the whole story? Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes people join groups for, for specific reasons and needs, and then they're subjected to brainwashing. But I think that, um, that um, Tom Cruise's uh, life growing up, um, he was looked upon and looked up to by high school uh, as someone who was a problem solver. You know, if there was a bully, he really went hard at it to make it in the movies. He overacted in all his early movies. Then he gets the impossible mission stories, and I think that he wanted it to be it for real. Mm -hmm. And the attraction for Scientology is that he could mix his persona, top gun persona, you might say, into a way of believing that he was doing it in, in real life. Mm -hmm. um, I feel sorry for him because he's lost some marriages and problems with his children. And I think that one day he'll have an awakening and that when that happens, uh, it's going to hit him very hard. So just so that I'm clear, is there a precise definition for the word brainwashing or is it, or, or, or being brainwashed or is it a, by its nature an imprecise term? I mean, it's, no, loo it's, no, loose, right? no, it's used not, very loosely. It's, it's, loose, it's used very loosely and very incorrectly. You have uh, Mitt Romney's but, father saying he was brainwashed, uh, which ruined his, you know, uh, his political campaign. Uh, uh, every type of undue influence or persuasion gets lumped together under brainwashing. So what is Mayo the precise? Sits young yeah. created brainwashing. As I said, it involves immersing a person into a group where the group convinces the person that his life was horrible, his father and mother are responsible for all his mistakes of life, and that we are happy, smiling, wonderful people because we have learned the truth and you can be like us. And then you control the milieu, you control the information, you teach a different language, there's a system of rewards and punishments. Mm -hmm. And it's a very distinct uh, process you uh, raised the issue of brainwashing before the uh, California State Supreme Court. I guess it was in 1988. It was a case involving the Moonies. Uh, describe what happened there. Well, there was two instances of two youngsters, uh, both college uh, students. Uh, one had just passed the bar, uh, who arrived in San Francisco at a bus station and were surrounded by members of the Unification Church who invited them to dinner and um, uh, they said, are you the Moonies? And they said, no, are you religion? And they said, no. 
and went with them and never came back. And uh, both for uh, Moko was one of them. In fact, Moko got kidnapped and deprogrammed, and later he was on the, the kidnapping and deprogramming of the, of the girl, Leo. And um, they brought a lawsuit for being brainwashed mm -hmm. and um, uh, turned into uh, followers against their will. And at that time, there really wasn't much case law to recognize the existence of that. Pretty strange theory to expand upon. But there were some law professors who had written articles. So your mission well, was to go before the court and convince the court that brainwashing was first of all real, yes. and that second of all you could you know, sue for it, or you yeah. should be able to sue for yes. it. Yes, for compensatory and punitive damages. And the Supreme Court said that it was, uh, an out, it was outrageous behavior, and the interests of the family outweighed any, any uh, uh, hindrance to the practice of religion. And that, uh, and that uh, Unification Church could be sued for. So after you won that case, were there a lot of causes of action based on this brainwashing theory? Uh, I'm sure there were. Uh, a lot of problems have arisen in some cases because lawyers have taken them and don't know what they're doing and don't plead them properly. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I did. You know, it was. Uh, up until then, I never took a case that in order to win, I had to prove brainwashing. I had to have ordinary torts that I could win without proving that they were brainwashing before I would take them. To me, brainwashing, if it got through, was the gravy. It was actually even a risk because it might get overturned on appeal. Mm -hmm. But once the Mokul decision came down, it was a different story. When you look at all these people who have started cults, you see the same person every time. Mm -hmm. And they usually tape record, as Nixon did, and they usually believe that one day that books will be written on how they save the world, as Jim's Don Jim Jones thought, and as he uh, tape recorded, as Diedrich tape recorded. Diedrich thought that when Time Magazine came to interview in December 78 when he switched partners, that he was going to be Time Man of the Year and that possibly would get the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so there's almost a manic quality about these people. There's a manic quality, but they're very insecure, uh, very narcissistic, uh, very paranoid, and uh, concerned with their place in history. You know, but, what Jim Jones did was an order of magnitude more serious than... Well, most sociopathic people do not commit murder. Yeah. Most of them are senators, <laughs> judges, president of the United States. You know, they, they're all over the place in Wall Street. And um, uh, a secondary uh, infliction must happen for someone to become, say, a serial killer. But if that happens, there's no conscious to stop them. So. Um, you know, when Synanon ended in 1978 and they sold the Marine, crop, Marine County properties, Earhart tried to buy them. And if he had moved in his followers into a camp setting isolated, there is no telling what might have ultimately come about. Mm. You know, Jim Jones, was getting crazier and crazier with power once he isolated himself in the Guiana jungle, just as Diedrich had isolated himself in, in cities. So you can see patterns. And Bhagwan Rashnish, as I mentioned in the book, I had telephoned the authorities and warned them that there was about to be violence because I could see where the pattern had developed too. Yeah. And it only turned out that I was wrong, the violence had already had begun. You mentioned, we've mentioned Esta a couple times in passing. Uh, let's talk about that group specifically for a moment. You know, I came to San Francisco in the 80s, and at that time it seemed that either uh, everyone had done Esta or at least known, had known someone who did Esta. Yes. What was it about Esta that made it so incredibly 
attractive to people. They were brainwashed. The Synanon trip was developed in 1967 in which squares of non-addictive people were brought into a hotel weekend mm -hmm. where they were uh, attacked for all their past behavior, stripped. They would go to their wives and friends and get dirt on them so they knew how to attack them. Everyone was attacked by the group until they would break down crying and have a catharsis. At the end of the 48 hours when they came out, as, well, Synon graduates were there with candlelights to hug them and hold them, and the message was given, there's hope and there's future, join Synanon. Warner Earhart copied the Synanon trip. As far as his, his uh, dialogue and pitches were, those were taken from Scientology. And uh, put together with some, uh, you know, dressing up and Earhart being a good-looking guy, um, and this again was the 70s where hippies had turned into yuppies and the human potential movement was all about searching for benefits. I used to say, this is a crack up. People are spending $350 to get what the prisoners of war in Korea got for free. So I understand your fiance uh, was uh, someone who got involved with this. Yeah, my fiance was. Um, sort of uh, looking for a spiritual side, as many people were in those days. Uh, I remember once we were somewhere where they turned off the lights and everyone was touching themselves in the dark. When the lights came on, I was in the kitchen eating chicken out of the refrigerator. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, we, it was a difficult thing. And then when I realized, Sinan had served me with some lawsuits saying I was trying to interfere with the practice of religion. And I began to get more and more knowledge about Sinan's attacks on people and the existence of the Imperial Marines, and realized I'd passed the point of no return. And then not only was I in danger, but they were in danger. And somehow I had to communicate this to her. And um, when I called, she was at an S training. So, um, yeah, I remember I wanted to. Um, there was a sense of wanting revenge on Warner Earhart. I remember, I remember uh, the second uh, James Bond movie, he wants to go after the people who killed his fiance in the first one. Mm -hmm. And uh, M says, you want revenge? And he says, no, I'm just doing my job. So I'm not after revenge. And I'm just watching it, and I'm thinking, bull, <laughs> you want revenge. So, so would you say your fiance was brainwashed? When she came out of it, she had the, um, oh, it was uh, the benefits, and she had, she was speaking the words, and she was one step away. But you know, brainwashing doesn't work without reinforcement. Unless they get you into the graduate programs or everything, you might actually have beneficial results from going through the S training because of the introspection that goes on. The question is, do they get you in? But it did lead to us, to, to her breaking it off, uh, saying that um, uh, she needed her spiritual side and that she couldn't marry me. And um, I went off to Hawaii pretty angry, thinking that if I never got involved with cinema and I hadn't learned all the things I learned, then nothing that she was doing would have ever bothered me, and we would have lived happily ever after. And. Um, Finally, um, when I got bit, um, I actually was seeing somebody and she wanted to come to the hospital. And I said no, I told my friend to tell her she could not go. And she said, why? And I said, you don't think for one moment Trudy won't come. And so Trudy showed up at the hospital and she stayed all night. She listened to my press speeching about cults and said she was sorry she never listened to me, that she understands now, and would I, would I take her back? And uh, I was very much in love with her. So it seemed like a happy ending at the time. But late December, there was a raid on Synanon and Badger, and they took a tape they found of Charles Diedrich called The New Religious Posture, Don't F with Synanon. 
And in it, Deidre talked about the training in the Imperial Marines, people they had beaten up, that they were going to kill people, mm -hmm. and that uh, they mentioned that the lawyers were the worst enemies, and the end of the tape was, then we get his wife, and then we get his kids. And I looked at her face, and I knew she was gone. Mm -hmm. You know, and so... Uh, she couldn't live with that she danger. Couldn't. She was very much afraid. Paul, how old are you now? Ah, this is Trinity Klein Foods. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned um, 67. Uh -huh. And what's your health like these days? Uh, not very good. Uh, you're struggling with an illness? Yeah, several. Mm -hmm. um, when I was bitten, I was told that in 20 years I could have all sorts of problems or neurological problems from the toxicity of the rattlesnake. Around 1990, my fingers used to twitch. And um, since then, I googled rattlesnake bites and peripheral neuropathies, and I couldn't believe how many hits they were. And they said that the first symptom was finger twitching. And um, eventually, my pain in my fingers was numb. And uh, eventually, rheumatoid arthritis hit my hands. I uh, developed uh, a uh, benign form of Waldenstrom in 92, which was like a blood cancer, but not very aggressive, and usually did not appear in people until they were 67, and I was 42, mm. or 47. and. Um, uh, there was some speculation that uh, the rattlesnake could, venom could have been um, a part of that, mm -hmm. uh, and possibly a part of the red blood cell aplasia. But the red blood cell aplasia appeared when successful chemotherapy to the Waldenstrom. Afterwards, I was no longer able to make red blood cells. So let me ask you, is you're someone similar age, a little bit younger, I assume. How many vampire movies have you seen in your life? Uh, no more than 72. Okay. Well, did you ever think or imagine that one day you would live off the blood of others? Did, did, I, I can't say that I did. Well, that's what I do for the last 10 years. Your, your body cannot make red blood cells. Right. I have to have transfusions. I resisted all temptations under the full moon to put on a black cape and go out and get my own blood. It's strictly and, 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 from the nice people who donated. And this is perhaps a, the legacy of that snake bite? Perhaps. And, and what's your prognosis? My prognosis is not good. I went through a chemotherapy program for four months that was hoped would make my red blood cells grow. They started to, but they did not. And see, with, with each transfusion, iron is deposited into the body. And my ferritin and iron le level is about 3,000. Normal is 100. Mm. It caused me to have AFib heart filiation in 2009, so I have chronic heart problems. And uh, eventually, the iron is still pouring in because if I stop the transfusions, I die. I think the bigger question is not how long do I have left, but why am I still alive today? You know, mm -hmm. I consider having written that book uh, the best thing I did in my life because of the condition I was in. Because This it, is the book that you've just published. Yeah, and because it was important to transmit what I had learned, not to have it die with me. So let's say you had it to do over, and you never encountered that snake, but the condition was that you, were, you would have a normal legal career, uh, you know, finding tax loopholes for rich people or, or similarly boring. A better way to say, and, it, better and, way to say yeah. it would be that I was married to Trudy, raised her kids, and I was having lunch with Spielberg and Lucas about the next movie I was going to write. And uh, the answer to that is Chaz Morantz, my son. If all that had happened, 
he would not have been born, and curiosity might have crash-landed crash on Mars. And uh, I would never go back. So it sounds like you would change some things, but you wouldn't necessarily avoid that snake if it meant a radically different trajectory. Than if it meant that on. my son wasn't going to be born, I would not have. I would have stuck my hand in the mailbox. Is what I'm saying. Well, Paul, thank you so much for doing okay. this. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. I enjoyed it too. <laughs>